This is going to be Romans chapter 2, verse by verse. And we're going to look at the subject of wicked sayings of the age. What are some wicked things people are saying today that are completely unbiblical? Number one, only God can judge me. That's a wicked saying of this age. Look at Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For in thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. So see the word therefore at the beginning of the verse? That shows it's a continuation from chapter 1. And at the end of chapter 1, remember Paul listed all that long list of sins. And he says in this verse, Thou art inexcusable. So you have no excuse for not turning to God if you're judging somebody. Because when you judge somebody and say they shouldn't be doing those certain sins, you're admitting yourself that you know right from wrong. And you're admitting yourself that you do right or wrong. And when a lost man judges another, he condemns himself. That is why the verse says, Wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. So when you go and say he's wrong for committing adultery, you know adultery's wrong. And maybe you're not committing that sin, but you're committing other sins. Showing that you know right from wrong. You realize you're a sinner. You realize you've sinned. Now the first wicked saying of the age, as I said, is only God can judge me. And that sounds good and right if you don't know the Bible. But the Bible teaches that Christians have a right to judge. In 1 Corinthians 2.15 it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So a Christian has a right to judge. If you don't judge, then you can't discern between what's right and what's not right. And if you don't judge, then wickedness will just run rampant. And the devil will just do what he wants to do. Because Christians aren't judging certain things. And sin will get in. The rapper Tupac, who's dead now, made the phrase popular, only God can judge me. That's what he said all the time. Most of the people say this because they don't want anyone telling them that what they're doing is wrong. And they have a false idea of who, who God even is. They think Christians are self-righteous and take away all the fun. And they think that God is just some fairy tale who lives up in the clouds. So they say, only God can judge me. Because they don't really know who God is. But don't worry, God will judge you. And you shouldn't treat it lightly. Like they do when they say that. That should strike fear in the heart of every lost person knowing that God is going to judge you because you're going to stand in front of God Almighty at, the, at a judgment seat one day. So when you say only God can judge me, that should scare you. It shouldn't be your ticket out of supposed to be living how you're supposed to live. Like people will say it like, I'm going to keep doing this because only God can judge me, not these self-righteous Christians. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God, as the Bible says. Now, Romans 2.2, 2, it says, "Be But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. So the judgment of God is according to truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So God is true. Titus 1.2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So you have a judge who's true that cannot lie. And I'm glad we have a real, true, and righteous judge who won't lie. But it's still a fearful thing to fall in the, into the hands of a living God if you're not saved and if you're not right with God. Romans 2, 3 says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Nobody is going to escape the righteous judgment of Almighty God. The old man in the verse is referring to lost sinners. And the old man won't have anything to say but amen, when the Lord righteously and justly casts him into the lake of fire. But what is another wicked saying of the age? Another one is, judge not lest you be judged. And that's a misquotation of Matthew 7, 1. And people said that phrase so many times that they claimed that the Mandela effect changed the Bible. But it didn't. It says, judge not that you be not judged. In Matthew 7, 1... And it says, For with what judgment ye judge, 
ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured, measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite! First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. So this isn't saying you can't judge someone or something. It's warning against hypocritical judgment. If you're in sin and you're telling someone else to get out of their sin, then you're being a hypocrite. Take the beam out of your eye, and you can see clearly to get what's in your brother's eye. But judge not, lest you be judged, is a favorite saying of most lost people and worldly Christians who just want to live like the devil without hearing any lip from any Christians. Now Romans 2, four, it says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. A favorite saying of the lost world and the atheist world is that God is sadistic, or that the God of Christians is violent and mean. And they'll say they don't want to serve a God like that. But the Bible teaches that God is good. Look at the verse. The verse said in Romans 2, 4 that he is good. He's forbearing. He's long-suffering. God isn't even as mean as some Bible preachers make him out to be. Second Peter two or Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us who are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved, no matter who they are. And then is Ezekiel thirty three eleven says, saying to them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God wants all the wicked to turn to him. He doesn't want them to die and go to hell. God doesn't want to see the lost men die and go to the lake of fire. That's why God came down, the Lord Jesus Christ died to pay for man's sins. Your sins were paid for on the cross. You just have to accept the payment. So God isn't sadistic. The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, as the verse said in Romans 2, 4. What that means is every bad thing that God allows to happen to a lost man is doing the lost man a favor. It's the lost rich people who never have anything going bad in their life. They're the ones that are in a world of trouble. Because when God lets you live it up and you don't have time to hit rock bottom and think about eternity and think about where you're going to go when you die, that's dangerous shape to be in because you're just going to continue living your fun life without God. But God leads lost men to repentance by letting their world fall apart. People love the saying, why do bad things happen to good people? That's another wicked saying of the age. But God lets bad things happen to the sinner so that he'll get saved. He lets bad things happen to the Christian so they draw nigh to him. Now Romans 2, five it says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath, wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The impenitent heart, is the opposite of a repentant heart. They're hard. Proverbs 29 1 says, He that oft being often reprove, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Don't you realize that God can knock your head off in the floor? God has your breath in his hands. He can have you in a car wreck tonight and have you killed. Why do you revolt more and more? Why do you keep hardening your heart and being impenitent? Meaning, not repent it. The verse said, You are treasuring up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath. The day of wrath has to do with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, The revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The same way Christians set up treasures in heaven is the same way lost men are setting up treasures for the day of wrath, for when they're thrown in hell, for when they're cast into the lake of fire, for the great white throne judgment. You're just making... Hell and wrath and judgment, worse for you, the worse you live. Giving yourself a greater damnation. The Lord Jesus Christ on the day of wrath is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them which know not God. And that flaming fire is going to turn into a lake of fire on earth in the valley of Edomia, as it talks about in Isaiah 34. 
And it, men are going to literally be cast into that fire. It's going to be a literal hell on earth that you'll be able to see it during the millennial reign even. And if people don't line up with what God says during that time, they'll be cast into that lake of fire bodily. So don't set up treasures for hell. Don't set up treasures for when the wrath of God falls on you and gives you greater damnation. The day of wrath is when Jesus Christ comes back at the second advent. And during that time, you want to be on the winning side. What is another saying of the age? How about the phrase, follow your heart? Or, do what your heart says. Romans 2, 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. The heart is wicked. Jeremiah seventeen nine said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So following your heart, especially if you're a lost man and have a stony heart, is a bad idea. You need to get saved and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Following your heart and doing as they say, doing what makes you happy, is the worst advice that you can give a person. What about the phrase, I can sin and get by or I'm getting away with it? Romans 2, 6 says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds? So God is going to render to every man according to his deeds. Everything you do will be accounted for. And for the Christians, you will be judged for your service at the judgment seat of Christ. If you did good deeds, you get rewards. If all you did was bad deeds, you get nothing. If you do bad deeds, you'll reap it in the flesh. And for the lost man, you'll be judged according to your works at the great white throne judgment. How great a damnation will you receive? The just judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, is going to render to every man according to his deeds, and every idle word that man shall speak, he shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. And this verse has to do with the Gentile who never heard the gospel Never heard anything about God. If he was seeking God, then the Lord will get him the gospel. Like about Cornelius, if you read about him in Acts chapter 10. It says he was a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, yet he wasn't saved. So God got the apostle Peter to come to him, and Cornelius ended up getting saved and baptized afterwards. And many people have this saying, they say, what about the heathen that never heard? And they'll say this, you know, trying to make God look bad. But the heathen who's open to truth, acknowledging the God that he sees in the creation, God will get the gospel to him through missionaries or however else he wants to. Now, Romans 2, 8, it says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Notice you can have tribulation and wrath at the same time. Notice they're right there side by side. The Christian can have tribulation right now. Uh, if you're going through a hard time, you're going through a tribulation time. But you're not going through the time period called the tribulation, that seven-year time. Those who believe in a pre-wrath rapture will say the first three and a half years of the seven-year tribulation are called the tribulation. And they say the next three and a half years after that is called the wrath of God. But what makes them think you can't have tribulation and wrath at the same time as you see here in Romans? Christians are going to have tribulation, but we're not, not appointed to wrath. The first half of the tribulation is also the wrath of God because the Lamb is the one who opens the seals in Revelation chapter 6. The Lamb opens the first seal at the beginning of the tribulation, showing you it's the wrath of God. And since we aren't appointed to wrath, we're leaving in a rapture before the tribulation. But you can have tribulation and wrath going on at the same time. Now Romans 2, 8, 9 again, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, the truth is the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. 
You reap what you sow. Choose the way of unrighteousness and reap indignation, wrath, tribulation, and anguish. Romans 2.10 But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Sow good things, reap good things. Romans 2.11 For there is no respect of persons with God. Anybody who will believe the gospel goes to heaven. Anyone who rejects it goes to hell. The offer is out there for anybody because there is no respect of persons with God. Romans 2.12 For as many ha as have sinned without law, this would be Gentiles who sin without having the oracles of God. For those who sinned without law, the Gentiles, shall also perish without law. The Gentiles who defiled their conscience and didn't seek a God, they could see God through the invisible, yet they chose not to seek God and they perished. And as many have sinned in the law, shall be judged by the law. Those who sinned in the law would be the Jew. They preached circumcision, but since they broke other parts of the law, their circumcision promise, profits them nothing. So it says, For as many as have sinned without law, the Gentile shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law, the Jew shall be judged by the law. Romans 2.13 For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Now, no one is eternally justified by keeping the law. In the Old Testament, the doers of the law were blameless and temporarily justified until they sinned again. And they would have to offer the proper sacrifice to get blameless again after they sinned. However, the blood of bulls and goats and good works still didn't get them eternal salvation. However, their faith and works got them to paradise. No one was ever justified by the law of Moses in the sense of that's how they got to the third heaven and got eternal salvation. But today we are justified by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Justified means to declare righteous. And our justification is different than any type of justification that went on before the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay for our sins. We are declared righteous if we get in Christ by believing the gospel. The Old Testament saints didn't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They had their own righteousness that got them to paradise in the heart of the earth. But their righteousness would never be good enough to get them eternal salvation. Jesus had to die so that we could get his imputed righteousness. Romans 2.13 For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. God doesn't just want you to hear the word. He wants you to do it. Romans 2.14, For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. Now look at the verse. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law. For example, Abimelech back in the book of Genesis was a heathen who had the commandments written in his heart. But he didn't know God. He didn't have a Bible. Yet he refused to commit adultery with Abraham's wife the moment he found out it was his wife, showing he had the law written in his heart. And this was before the law of Moses even came out. He knew what was right and what was wrong in his heart because God put it there. Romans 2.15 says, "...which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another." The unsaved Gentile lived by his conscience. The heathen had it written in his heart. He knew he was sinning. Their conscience will either accuse them or excuse them. And this is where you get sayings like, everybody's doing it, or a little bit won't hurt, or one more time won't matter. Their conscience excuses them when they talk this way. Even in the life of a Christian, sometimes a Christian will excuse his own sins because he sees other Christians committing a certain sin. And he'll say in his mind, well, he's doing it and he's a preacher, so it's okay for me to do it too. So you excuse yourself to commit the same sin, which is wrong. Now, Romans 2.16, it says, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So God is going to judge the deep and secret things of men. And this will be at the great white throne judgment. 
and a common saying today among mockers and atheists is, I'll laugh in God's face. However, God will get the last laugh. In Proverbs one twenty six, it says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. So God gets the last laugh, and he who laughs last laughs best. He knows your secrets. You're not getting anything by him. Psalms 44.21, Shall not God search this out? For he knoweth the secrets of the heart. So, Romans 2.16, In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So the rapture is going to take place. The time of Jacob's trouble is going to be going on down here on earth. The judgment seat of Christ is going to be going on up in heaven. Then after this, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back to kill all the God-haters and set up the millennial kingdom. Then after 1,000 year reign, the white throne judgment would take place where God will judge the wicked from every age and the saved people from the tribulation and the millennium because they weren't able to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And this is where God will show you all your secrets if you're not saved and you won't laugh in God's face. Ever heard someone say, that they're going to keep something, their dirty little secret, but God sees it. He sees every dirty secret, and it will come to the light at the judgment. But now we're going to look at the self-righteous Pharisee Jew who thought he was good enough to make it to heaven by keeping the law. And this is where you get the saying, I'm a good person, I'm going to heaven, as they say. However, this is unbiblical because nobody is good and we are all sinners for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need the perfect blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to take away your sins. But now let's look at the mind of a person who thinks they're good enough to get to heaven. Romans 2.17 Behold, there art called, called a Jew and restest in the law and makest thy boast of God. Notice it says they rest in the law. However, they really did it. They rested in their own tradition. Matthew 15, 9 says, But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. They don't really care about what God said. They care about their own tradition. They care about their own commandments, the commandments of men. They boast about knowing God and having their oracles of God, but they really don't care what God said. And that reminds me of many KJV only people who aren't really KJV only. They're not actually a Bible believer. You can say you're King James only and not be a Bible believer. You want to be King James only and a Bible believer because if you're just King James only, you'll take your tradition over the book every time they conflict. So you can be King James only and still not be a Bible believer. And there's plenty of preachers going around saying, I got the right book, and this book is perfect, it's inerrant. Yeah, they don't believe it's inerrant. As soon as it crosses line with their tradition and goes against their tradition, they'll take their tradition every time. So they're not a Bible believer. Or if they got a study Bible that corrects the King James in the notes, they'll say the book's perfect until their notes say that something's wrong in the book, and then they'll take the notes over the book. And that's how you make God a liar when you're a liar yourself. Now, Romans 2.18 says, And knowest his will, and, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Notice that Paul is just being sarcastic when he's saying all this stuff. He's saying what they say about themselves and what they think about themselves. But the self-righteous person trying to get to heaven by their own goodness thinks that they're good. But they didn't really approve things that are excellent. Because they didn't even approve of Jesus Christ. Romans 2.19 says, And art confident that thou thyself art a God of the blind, a lot of them which are in darkness. Complete sarcasm again because they were blind guides, not guides of the blind. Look at Matthew 15.14. It says, Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So they're not a God of the blind. They're blind gods. They're fools of blind gods. Romans 2.20 An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth and the law. They aren't instructors of the foolish. They are the fools. As Jesus calls them in Matthew 23.17 
And notice it says, has the form of knowledge. They have a form of God, but deny the power thereof, as 2 Timothy 3.15 talks about. Romans 2.21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? They'll, they go around condemning everybody for their sin, and then they commit the same sin. They look down on a man for stealing, yet they steal. They look down on a man for committing adultery, yet they commit adultery. Similar to the story in John 8, where they were condemning the woman caught in adultery, when the woman was probably caught in the act with one of them. Romans 2.22, Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? The self-righteous Pharisees who claimed Jesus Christ would have been an idol actually were idol worshippers themselves because they love money. If you look at Luke sixteen thirteen and 14, it says, Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. So that shows... The Pharisees' God was money. They were idol worshippers. Now Romans 2.23 Thou that makest thy boast of the law through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? Notice that they break the law that they profess to uphold. Romans 2.24 For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you, as it is written. So when you claim to be of God and you live wicked in the sight of men... You then give me an occasion to blaspheme. It gives them the opportunity to say, Well, they got God and they got salvation, and yet they act how they act. So I don't need their God. I can act just as good as they do without God. And just like Nathan told David when he committed murder and adultery, he says in Second Samuel twelve fourteen, Howbeit, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. So when you commit such wicked things in front of people, it just gives them occasion to blaspheme God. Now Romans 2.25 For circumcision verily, verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. This is saying just because you're circumcised doesn't mean anything. Circumcision was a sign given to Abraham to show that the Jews were a chosen people of God, a peculiar people. But this verse is saying, circumcision does you no good if you don't keep the whole law. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. So you can keep the whole law, and then break it in one point, and you're as good as dead. That's why you need the Lord Jesus Christ, because nobody can be justified by the law. Nobody can keep the law perfectly. You need Jesus Christ, who did keep the law perfectly, and he was without sin. Romans 2.26 says, Therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Now look at the verse. The uncircumcision in the verse refers to the Gentiles, and he has the law written in his heart. And if he follows his conscience, the light that God has given him, then his uncircumcision was counted for circumcision. If the lost heathen seeks after God, God will get the gospel to him so that he can be saved. In the Old Testament, the Gentile followed his conscience. He did what God told him to do. He followed the light that God gave him. And if he did this, he would have went to paradise in the heart of the earth when he died. He wasn't saved because nobody in the Old Testament was saved in the sense that me and you are today because the Lord Jesus Christ hadn't even died on the cross yet. But men did what God told them to do and that got them to paradise in the heart of the earth where they would wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to shed his blood. Nobody was looking forward to the cross. They didn't know the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection as we know today. Now Romans 2.27 And shall not uncircumcision which is by nature fulfill the law judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? This is saying that the uncircumcision which is the Gentile if they fulfill the law will judge the uncircumcised Jew who transgresses the law. Romans 2.28 and 29 says For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly 
Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Now the circumcision here is not the circumcision made without hands of Colossians 2.11 that me and you get today when we're born again. This circumcision was an act of the will. That's referred to in Deuteronomy 10.16 where it says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no, be no more stiff necked But this is different than the spiritual circumcision of Colossians 2.11 because the Lord himself is the one who cut your soul loose from your flesh. So you need to notice the difference between those two circumcision. But this has been Romans chapter 2, and we've looked at wicked sayings of the age.